Welcome to the second part of lecture 16, the relaxation method. It's entitled Relax, It's Just Math. So we're going to tell you about a numerical method that is used to solve Poisson, uh, Laplace's equation. It's a relatively straightforward and relatively simple method, and so I want to go through it in detail so that you can get an idea that solving these complicated differential equations when you use a computer is actually not all that difficult to do. And you're going to get an opportunity on the lab to actually go through a couple of steps of this algorithm by hand with pencil and paper for a few points to get an understanding of where a picture like the one on the left, which is the actual solution of Laplace's equation, comes from. And we're going to be focusing on that particular example of Laplace's equation in the lab that we're going to be doing uh, in just a couple of days. So we start by considering Laplace's equation in just two dimensions. I'm going to work in Cartesian coordinates, where the Laplacian acting on phi is just the second derivative of phi with respect to x plus the second derivative of phi with respect to y, and the sum of those two has to equal zero. What we're going to do is we're going to discretize it because computers cannot actually take derivatives. They have to work with discretized versions of functions. And so if you look here on the left-hand side, we're taking a step delta in the x direction and a step delta in the y direction. The dark circles are the lattice points, and the one in the center corresponds to x, y. And so there'd be a value of the potential phi of x, y associated with that point in the center. And then we have the values of phi when I shift to the left by one point, phi of x minus delta y, and we have the value of phi when I shift to the right, phi of x plus delta y. We have the value of phi when I shift up, phi of x, y plus delta, and when I shift down, phi of x, y minus delta. And so there are five different values of phi represented by the five different points on this object, which is usually called the star, sometimes it's called the cross. So we now need to work out what is the second derivative in terms of those objects. Now, if you've seen this before, this formula will look pretty obvious to you. In the x direction, it would be phi of x plus delta y minus 2 phi of x y plus phi of x minus delta y divided by del squared. And then a similar formula, formula in the y direction, where now it's y that gets shifted by delta or by minus delta. But you might not really have seen that formula before, so let me show you a quick and dirty way to derive that. Uh, we're going to derive the first term in this expression. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Taylor series expansion for phi of x plus delta y about the point x, y. So my shift is delta. And so the Taylor series expansion says first evaluate at your function point. So I have phi of x, y. And then I have the deviation, which is delta, multiplied by the derivative evaluated at xy. So that's delta times d phi of xy with respect to x. And then I have to add 1 half delta squared times the second derivative. So I get 1 half delta squared, the second derivative of phi with respect to x squared, and so forth. The next term would be a 1 6 delta cubed times the third derivative of phi with respect to x, and on and on. Okay? Now let me do the exact same thing for phi of x minus delta. And nothing changes except for the middle term where the delta goes to minus delta because del minus delta squared is the same as delta squared. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the sum of these two terms. And when we add them together, you can immediately see the derivative terms are going to cancel. I'm going to be left with two of the phi of xy terms, and I'm going to be left with a uh, second derivative multiplied by delta squared. So if I take that and move the two phi of x, y terms to the left-hand side, I get phi of x plus delta y minus two phi of x, y plus phi of x minus delta y. And that is just left with the sum of the last two terms, which is delta squared times the second derivative of phi with respect to x squared. Okay, I get the second derivative then by dividing the whole thing by delta squared. But lo and behold, that was the formula that I said was the approximation to the second derivative of phi with respect to x squared. Now we know it's an approximation because there are third order terms and higher order terms that we dropped. We didn't include in this analysis, so it's not an exact relation. But as delta gets smaller and smaller, it becomes more and more accurate. 
Okay, so we've determined a discretized version of Laplace's equation. And I'm just repeating that for you here. We're going to set that equal to zero. And all I'm going to do is you notice there's a phi of x, y. There actually are four of them in this equation. I'm going to just solve for phi of x, y. And what I'm going to get is an equation that says phi of x, y is one fourth the sum of the four values of phi shifted by delta, either up or down or left or right. And it's taking the average of those four points. And so in words, what we can say is phi of x, y, the potential at x, y, is the average of the potential on the four points on the cross connected to x, y. And when this occurs, I actually satisfy Laplace's equation. And so this motivates the idea for the relaxation method. And let me go through it. There are five steps to it. The first thing we do is we discretize the xy plane into a grid that has a spacing delta. Then we initialize phi on the boundary. Remember, we know exactly what phi is on the boundary because that's the boundary condition that is input into the problem from the start. Then we're going to make a guess for the initial value of phi on the interior. We could take it equal to the value on the boundary if the value on the boundary was a constant, or we can uh, maybe take a linear curve that goes between the results on two different boundaries or what have you. We can make whatever guess we want. We have to come up with some initial guess. And then we update phi at each point according to the relaxation equation above. So I visit my first point and I replace phi by the average on the cross. And then I move to the next point and I replace phi by the average on the cross and so forth. I just keep repeating this over and over. And we just go through visiting each point. Once we've gone through the entire lattice, we come back to the first point again. We revisit it and so forth. And we just keep going through this iterating and iterating until the potential stops changing. And when the potential stops changing, we have gotten now our numerical approximation to what the potential is that satisfies Laplace's equation. And doing that gives things like this picture on the left-hand side, which I'm going to show to you in a couple of different ways when we get into the laboratory that we're going to be dealing with on Laplace's equation, which is in just a few days. OK, there are two other things I want to talk about. The first is the directional derivative. So suppose we have a surface defined by x, y, f of x, y. So that's saying z is equal to f of x, y. And I want to compute the difference of that function between x, y, and two shifted points, x plus delta x and y plus delta y. So I'm going to compute delta f is f of x plus delta x, y plus delta y minus f of x, y. And if I use the Taylor series expansion and just keep the lowest order terms, f of x plus delta x, y plus delta y is equal to f of x, y plus delta x times the derivative in the x direction of f of x, y plus delta y times the derivative in the y direction of f of x, y minus f of x, y. And that means that the f of x, y terms cancel. and I'm left just with the derivative terms. And I'm going to rearrange those derivative terms into a unit vector multiplied by delta s. Remember, delta s is just the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. It's the hypotenuse of the delta x, delta y right triangle. And that ends up being dotted into the gradient of f of x, y. And just to be sure we're all on the same page, u is equal to delta x times the unit vector in the x direction plus delta y times the unit vector in the y direction divided by delta s. The gradient of f is the derivative of f with respect to x multiplied by the unit vector in the x direction plus the derivative of f with respect to y multiplied by the unit vector in the y direction. And if I then solve for u dot the gradient, I find that's equal to delta f of x, y with respect to delta s. Now, delta f with respect to delta s, that's kind of like the derivative along a path that has a distance delta s that I've traveled along that path. And we're saying that that derivative is equal to this unit vector u dotted into the gradient. This object of u dotted into a gradient is what's called a directional derivative. And this is the derivative of f in the direction given by the path s, where I've gone this small distance along the path given by delta s.
So it's important to note that u is a unit vector. Now, it's also important now to think about this for a moment. What is the norm of a unit vector times some other vector? Well, it's at most equal to the other vector. Otherwise, there's some cosine of the angle between the unit vector and the direction of the second vector. So what that tells us is that the directional derivative will have a maximal norm when the unit vector is actually in the same direction as the gradient. What that tells us is that the gradient points in the direction where the function changes the most. The direction of the maximal change of the function f is along the gradient. And this fact is very useful if we want to minimize a function that depends on many different variables. What we find is, is if we step along the direction of the gradient, that moves us in the direction where the function changes the most and gets us closest to the minimum value. Doing this in a numerical technique where I keep iterating the steps according to what the gradient is, is a method that's called steepest descents. And it's a very effective method to finding the minimum of functions that have multiple variables. It is very similar to a multidimensional generalization of Newton's method, which you might have heard of as a method to solve for uh, solutions of one-dimensional equations, but it can also be used in an appropriate fashion as a way of minimizing a function. Okay, there's one more point I want to make. We're going to be looking at objects called isosurfaces. An isosurface is just a curve given by f of x, y is equal to a constant. And they're the analogs of contour lines on a map that plot the lines of constant height or constant elevation on the map. This is something that you're familiar with. You've seen it many times on different kinds of maps. Now, since the isosurfaces are regions where the function does not change its value, the gradient has to be perpendicular to the contour lines. Because if the gradient had any component along the contour line, that would say that along that contour line, the function is changing its value. But we know the contour line is constructed by all of the points where the function does not change its value. So the gradient must be perpendicular to those isosurface lines. And so you can see now, if you look in the picture at the bottom, because of that, it's very clear that as I step along the gradient, I'll be stepping perpendicular to those lines and I'll be going down to the bottom of the well or I'll be climbing up to the top of the hill. The path might not be completely direct and I might have some turns that go somewhat in the wrong direction until I finally get on track and start moving in the right direction. But eventually this method will get me to the top of the mountain or to the bottom of the valley. And this is a pictorial way that helps us understand this method of steepest descents because moving down the steepest slope at each step is obviously going to eventually get me to the bottom. And I hope that this has clarified for you uh, the details of how the steepest descent works. And I hope also this notion that the gradient is showing us the direction over which the function is changing the most, that that is a concept that you also have been able to pick up from this lecture. It's a very important concept and one that you will need to use and think about in your future physics and math careers.